And uh, finally, we can start. So once again, good evening, everyone. It's Friday, 23rd September, and we are in conversation with Ambassador Edith Grace Sempala. Um, I believe um, a, a lot of us know quite a bit about Ambassador Sempala. Uh, she is the uh, w Women League Coordinator for Alliance for National Transformation. And uh, she used to be uh, representing Uganda as a diplomat uh, for 22 years uh, in different countries around the world. And uh, my first question would be maybe a quick one. Uh, Ambassador Sempala, please tell us, uh, where have you traveled as a, a, a Ugandan ambassador? Yeah, good evening, uh, Nada. Good evening, Nada. And good evening, listeners. Um, thank you very much, all of you, for joining us in this conversation. Um, I was, I started off as ambassador of Uganda to the Nordic countries. Those are five countries, uh, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, Finland, and Iceland. Then I was, um, Posted to United States of America, and uh, I was then uh, sent to the African Union covering Ethiopia and Djibouti. And I was there for only two years. The rest, I was there for 10 and nine and a half. <laughs> yeah, first of all, Anata, when I came back, I really desired to retire uh, after the World Bank, because I was at the World Bank for four years after my diplomatic um, uh, career. Um, when I returned, I wanted really to just rest and uh, maybe take it easy. But I just couldn't settle because of the situation in Uganda. I felt like the reason why I joined um, uh, activism and eventually diplomacy had not been fulfilled. So I found myself back into uh, this time politics. Uh, so uh, when I joined the Alliance for National Transformation, I was basically looking for uh, a, a party that shared my values. And I found it in Alliance for National Transformation. Um, and I found myself being nominated because I wasn't elected uh, as, a, as, a, as a national coordinator for Women League. This was kind of new to me because I've never really covered just women. But it was also exciting because I believe that uh, women, uh, we are majority, but uh, at the same time in decision-making, we are minority big time. Uh, so, and, and I, I feel like, you know, there is so much that women can achieve if they are engaged. So I was, uh, I, I found that role uh, interesting, challenging, and I accepted it. Uh, my role really is to mo mobilize, to motivate, to inspire, and then recruit women to be involved. Because I believe that uh, if women, since we are majority in the country, if we participated, uh, we could make a big difference. Because I believe that uh, women have a different perspective generally to leadership, to, uh, to what we want to see for the future of our children and, and, and the future generation. So basically that is what I do. And uh, it is quite an interesting thing, but it is also extremely challenging because um, women face uh, many, many challenges 
One of them, of course, is the workload of women, uh, well, you know, as, as mothers, as wives, as uh, leaders. So you have like three, three full-time jobs that you have to juggle. And then, uh, but also we know that if we don't, and then the future is at stake. So we have to find a balance and we have to be engaged. Back to you, Nadia. How do you expect to motivate uh, more women to join ANT? I would like to ask, uh, what are the specific programs that Women League is engaging in within Alliance for National Transformation? And uh, may I remind you to unmute your microphone on Zoom as well when you are speaking? Okay. Um, the, the main uh, thrust in terms of programming is really training. Training, training, training. Uh, because first of all, um, ANT is somehow a unique party. It is a unique party with a high expectation. Uh, we are expected to behave, to walk the talk uh, as women, but as members of Alliance for National Transformation as well, because we cannot give what we do not have. Uh, so that requires a, a mindset a change because we are functioning in an environment that has been polluted. Uh, so, you know, encouraging women to really walk the talk and to get out and, and be active is, is very important. So we do that through training. Uh, we train, we have a number of uh, women counselors that went through, uh, who have been trained with other uh, successful um, uh, candidates of ANT 
uh, because again, uh, the expectation from them is very high. Uh, and with expectation, we would like people to be trained so that they know what to do, what not to do, and how to do it. I would like us to move towards uh, the question of leadership and accountability. So the first question is how important is accountability to ANT and how important is it to our nation as a whole? Account accountability is very, very important, Nada, uh, because the, the, it, whenever there is no accountability, then you cannot uh, hold your leaders accountable. Uh, so uh, as a culture, it needs to be developed and perfected because um, over the years, uh, since independence actually, we have been having a challenge of leaders who start off well, but along the way they uh, drift and they become an, uh, an, unaccountable. They become law unto themselves. Uh, and that has been the, the, the challenge. And for us, we believe that the challenge really is having leaders who do not have values, who are not values driven, uh, but driven by, by what they can gain as individuals or you know, for their families. So it started off small, of course, with the, the first uh, leader after independence, I met on uh, It continued and it has been getting worse. So uh, obviously uh, every listener who, is, uh, who has joined us uh, knows how, how the issue of accountability, uh, I think the servant leadership is lacking uh, and as you know, that our leader says that they are not they are not no servants of anybody. Uh, they are rulers, basically not leaders. Yeah. So that is uh, uh, that is the status of our country, and therefore, for us uh, in Alliance for National Transformation, since we want to transform the nation, accountability becomes a cardinal principle that we must. Uh, pursue uh, uh, seriously, we must walk the talk because very often people talk about uh, good things. They talk about uh, being, uh, 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 doing good things for people, but uh, the walk very often is the opposite. Uh, in one of our conversations, you quoted John Maxwell, uh, who said that everything rises and falls with leadership. How do you interpret this quote with the current leadership situation in our country today? Yeah, indeed, everything falls uh, or rises with the leadership. Uh, and Uganda is a perfect example of falling uh, with leadership uh, because when leaders don't lead or mislead, uh, people follow, many people follow. And things very often degenerate. Uh, in Uganda, everything has degenerated. Corruption is, uh, is endemic. It is, uh, it is, it has almost consumed our society. Uh, accountability in terms of, uh, you know, uh, of uh, accounting for what the, the, the being of a government is lacking. Uh, accountability of resources, accountability of actions, of policies. Very often we have very good policies, but implementation lacks. So we end up just uh, continuing as business as usual. So that is one. Uh, and and uh, to, what comes to my mind as a perfect example of rising with leadership, uh, you know, on leadership 
is a country like Singapore. Singapore, as everybody knows, was almost at the same level with Uganda at our independence. And we all know where, where Singapore is uh, today. Uh, even if it was not, it didn't start off as a, uh, as a democracy, but uh, it was accountable in so many ways. It, it pursued policies of meritocracy, uh, accountability, and, uh, you know, and that, is, that has led them to be where they are today. So uh, we know that uh, Uganda can achieve that as well with good leadership. But the current leadership seems to be so entrenched. Uh, I, I'm even wondering, um, first of all, looking at the opposition in Uganda, I don't see that the, the current leadership feels any threat whatsoever. And uh, also looking at the people of Uganda, they don't seem to be interested in politics. So we have a bit of a catch 22, don't you think so? We do somehow, but uh, we always, we know that the challenge to the leadership here is themselves. They, they are the threat to themselves uh, because, uh, 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 because of their weaknesses, which they are not even interested in addressing because probably they, be, they believe that they benefit from those, those weaknesses. They see them as a strength uh, so their strength is very artificial as far as I'm concerned. And it is very clear to me, at least, and to many, I believe, that this regime uh, is seriously declining and does not have a future. So because of its weaknesses, which they are not able to address, uh, and so uh, the issue of Ugandans not being interested, I think is partly uh, because of lack of civic education. Uh, many of them believe that probably they can be safe out of politics, but it becomes uh, increasingly clear that there is no safe space and that politics affects every aspect of life, whether it is food, whether it is even the air we breathe, whether it is business, whether it is profession, everything is affected by politics. And therefore, once people understand that uh, one, they cannot run away from it, uh, they, can run, they can try to run away from politics, but politics will not run away from them. And that they, if they also understand that actually the solutions are in their own hands, that no one else is going to change Uganda for us. It is we Ugandans who are going to have to do something about it. And that it is doable. Then I think increasingly, they will come to understand that they really have to participate. There is no other option. There is no other option uh, and, uh, and it is doable. So if it is doable and there's no option, I believe that uh, if we intensify uh, making uh, mobilization and sensitization, I believe that people will understand that they need to participate. So you, you touched on civic education. Uh, why do you think civic education was removed from schools? I understand it was taught in schools and then it was just removed. What happened? <laughs> civic education Nada, is a tool, a very important empowerment tool. Because once you know, then you are empowered. So that is therefore why uh, I am sure 
uh, a dictatorship does not want people to know. Because the more ignorant people are, the more they can be oppressed, or uh, uh, the more they, they feel like, uh, uh, you know, that is their fate. So that is basically why I think that uh, uh, civic education has been taken out. And remember, once you educate young people uh, from, uh, say, secondary school, then you have really empowered them for life. So a dictatorship doesn't want people empowered. So pretty much our people are not aware that they have rights and uh, they're also not aware that uh, with those rights, they also have responsibilities to our country. Yeah, I think they probably know uh, that they, they should have rights, but the way they behave sometimes uh, seems like they really believe that uh, they don't have rights. You see, you know, when there is a challenge like floods, we've been having floods, uh, people calling for government to help, not demanding uh, that government should come and do its responsibility. So um, I think, therefore, when people uh, understand that actually uh, they, uh, uh, the, the, the kind of uh, uh, support they need from government is a right, not, not a favor from government, then they can demand. Uh, uh, and when they demand, uh, they can get it as a right, not as a favor. Uh, so, but uh, again, you've talked about the responsibility of a citizen. One is to participate. The most important, I think, uh, responsibility of a citizen is to participate in the affairs of the state and also to, uh, uh, to, to, to of course, pay taxes and, and things like that. But, but participation is very, very important. And uh, you, you find sometimes people not even voting because they feel like uh, maybe their vote doesn't matter or maybe it is just one. But if everybody says my vote doesn't, uh, that doesn't count then, and everybody doesn't vote, then you allow uh, those who are, uh, you know, who are not good uh, to thrive. There is a saying that uh, evil triumphs because good people do nothing. So it is our responsibility to demand and to participate and to get what we want. I was also hoping you were going to touch on the responsibilities like understanding the laws of the country and behaving according to the laws of the country. But uh, I am quite sure that uh, you, you're well aware of that. Uh, so maybe just for the benefit of our listeners, uh, tell us what's your opinion about this. Because the... Yeah, uh, it is very, very important that people understand the law, uh, the law, but it is also the responsibility of government to make it easy for people to understand the law. Because as you know, majority of our people are not uh, fluent in English and the laws are in English. So if they are not translated, if it is not made a priority, for people to uh, get those documents uh, in, their, in the languages they understand, it becomes very, very difficult. But uh, maybe they may not uh, translate everything, but at least if they translated the things which, uh, you know, where people understand their responsibility as citizens, uh, that they have the, 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 the importance of the rule of law, 
uh, and uh, uh, their, uh, the importance of their participation, then that would help. But as I said earlier, Nada, uh, a dictatorship wouldn't like that uh, because it thrives in ignorance of the masses. And uh, the more they can end up not be participating, the better for them. And also, uh, you know, if they can keep them ignorant and poor, uh, then uh, they feel like uh, they, they, they can do whatever they want. But then there is a certain level of selfishness and that can be very risky. Uh, uh, 30 years ago, Uganda counted maybe 12, 13, 15 million people. Right now we are hitting uh, 48, uh, if not more million Ugandans. So uh, being selfish, keeping the knowledge to uh, a specific group of people and not uh, sharing the knowledge of the laws with the rest of the, 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 the population, uh, that is very risky because that can backfire on the very group that uh, is, is keeping, keep, keeping people ignorant. Yeah. Um, I Yes, um, I would like to speak uh, through Twitter spaces uh, because it may be better. Yeah, uh, you are right, Nada, uh, that uh, selfishness is extremely dangerous to the one who is selfish because they cannot see beyond self and uh, very often it backfires. I don't even understand why they don't get it since history has got many examples of such leaders who have been extremely selfish and ended up very badly, who have looted their countries and eventually they didn't have even where to go. So yes, that is, uh, that is true. Um, as you know that uh, the uh, population growth of uh, Uganda is a high 3.5%, uh, which is, uh, I mean, as a country, we are not really overpopulated, but given the poverty level, it is not growing. Our population is not growing uh, at the same pace with our economic growth. So it creates serious uh, challenges. Um, it is said that in a, about 25 years, we may be a million Ugandans. So you can imagine if we do not have enough services for 45 million people, uh, how is it going to look like when we're 100 million? I think that is something that people must ask themselves that question, how will it look like? Uh, yeah, many of us may not uh, still be there, but our children, our, our grandchildren, our future generations, you know, uh, can, uh, will be there. And I always say, I mean, I don't get it uh, when people who are supposed to be really smart can't get that. And yet they have children, they have grandchildren, and uh, you know, the best inheritance they say is a good name. So, uh, and good acts left behind. I always say that uh, if you look at a country, say United States, if the founding fathers of United States had that a, a similar mindset like our leaders. Uh, would the United States be a superpower? No, certainly not. Uh, if Singapore uh, uh, had, uh, you know, the leader for, of Singapore had behaved like that, would Singapore in only uh, 60 years be in the first world? No. That is, to me, not rocket science. It should be very clear that, uh, you know, when you build a nation uh, and, then, and then, then the nation uh, builds you, builds the individual, 
all of us. So selfishness has never been a virtue. It has never benefited even the one who is selfish. But uh, that is, you know, that is uh, where we are. Uh, it is not understandable to me. I have to ask you to try and see what happened to your microphone on Twitter spaces. I don't see you speaking there. Uh, so something's wrong with your audio on Twitter spaces. Uh, but uh, to continue with our conversation on uh, Facebook and other platforms while you're resolving this, uh, I would like to ask, uh, uh, we talked about the responsibilities of the citizens, but um, uh, let's talk about the responsibilities of women in particular. And uh, I would like to maybe um, ask you to take us back to your, your childhood and uh, reflect on how your own mother instilled certain values in you and what were those values? And uh, I would also like to ask you to reflect on what has changed today. I need you to unmute. Yeah, I, I, I was saying that uh, a lot has changed in other uh, because uh, if I look at my childhood, uh, during my childhood, we were accountable. Integrity was a must, integrity. For instance, you could not come home with a dress, uh, you had to explain where that dress came from. And, uh, you know, our parents instilled in us that you do not uh, take things which don't belong to you, and that uh, you have to be honest, you have to be respectful uh, to especially elders, and uh, you had to work extremely hard uh, for a better future. So those virtues, those uh, values, sometimes you don't see them. You see people, you know, taking home things, uh, uh, you know, and not having to account from where they, those things came from. Uh, you may have people who have buildings. I mean, you have a salary, you're a civil servant, for instance, and you have uh, limited resources, but the assets you have are far beyond uh, what you could have uh, been able to, to buy with your, uh, you know, your salary. And nobody asks, or even people think that you are very smart. You must be smart. That is why you have uh, what you have. So it, 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 uh, the society today, it's like uh, being a thief, acquiring stuff is being smart, is being, uh, is, is honorable. And if you are, uh, uh, you, you have not stolen, uh, then it is like you are stupid. How come you've been in, a, in an office for that long and you have not been, and you have nothing to show, show in terms of amassing things. So that is, uh, that is going to be even a challenge after the current government, another. Uh, but uh, good enough, I believe that uh, uh, bad habits can be unlearned, uh, especially if you have good leadership that uh, walks the talk. I believe that it can be done, but it is not going to be easy. Uh, I have some questions that came through Twitter. Uh, what do you think needs to be done to get women even more active in politics? And why should women care? Then uh, what do you think holds them back from participating in, in politics? And uh, 
for those who are afraid to join politics, what small actions can they do to support the work of ANT? I'm sorry, we can't hear you, you're muted. Yeah, sorry, I, I've been getting help here. Yeah, what I was saying is that uh, there are many challenges that women face. Uh, one of the challenges is the workload. The workload is tremendous. Uh, you, uh, you know, as a woman, if you're a politician, uh, you and you have children, you are a full-time mother, you are a full-time, uh, you are uh, in full-time employment, you are a full-time wife, even being a wife is, is a job. So you find that therefore, if uh, one doesn't have uh, a, an understanding uh, spouse, it becomes extremely hard for the person to participate fully because the first priority is always given to children and rightly so but uh, you know what i'm saying is that uh, participating in politics uh, for me when i joined politics or activism i was doing it as a mother a full time mother a full time uh, worker a full time wife uh, but I thought that if I didn't do it, I would have betrayed my children because I would not have secured their future. So therefore, that is why participating in politics becomes very, very important. So one problem is workload. Secondly, is socialization. The way women have been socialized. And the fact that, uh, you know, uh, politics is seen as a dirty thing, uh, for us in the Alliance for National Transformation, we believe that it is not politics that is dirty, it is the, the dirty people who go into politics and dirty it, and that those dirty people are not going to clean it. Uh, and therefore, you need clean people to go into politics and clean it. So, Therefore, um, it, it requires, it takes sacrifice, therefore, uh, to be in politics uh, as a woman. Uh, three, of course, there is a fear factor. Fear is, uh, especially when you are operating in a dictatorship, uh, it always, uh, it is, it may, it may cost you, uh, but it costs not only women, but costs uh, all those who participate, especially those who want to change things. So um, uh, it definitely uh, women participation, first and foremost, we are 51% uh, of the population. So uh, we have the numbers. Secondly, we are the ones who are affected most. We are affected as individuals. We are affected through our children when there is no medicine in hospitals, uh, it is we who spend uh, you know, sleepless nights with the crying children uh, because they are sick or they are, you know, whatever is affecting them. And therefore, because we are the most affected, to me, it is like obvious that we should participate in finding solutions. Uh, so, as I said earlier, in Alliance for National Transformation, the environment for women participation is conducive uh, because of our values, because we believe in uh, giving space to women. And as I said, our national coordinator is a woman. And we have many uh, women who are very active and prominent. So uh, therefore, if we want to change for ourselves and most importantly for our children and the future generations, there is no other way 
but to participate. So participation is a must. It has a cost, but that is the price that we have to, to pay. You are muted, Nada, you are muted. Right, uh, let's start this question again. Um, I've done a bit of research and I realized in horror that uh, about 50% of mothers in Uganda are single parents. Uh, would you comment on that? I believe this is alarming. What is your take? Uh, Nada, it is indeed alarming, um, uh, but uh, I also believe that that is a responsibility for, for us women, uh, because socialization of children is the first and the foremost our responsibility. We are the ones who socialize children first, uh, up to say, um, five years, it is exclusively us. So uh, the reason for, for single mothers is that it seems like men uh, or young men are no longer feeling that they are responsible. They can have just children without any responsibility. Uh, it, it is pleasure without uh, what? Responsibility. So, so, and I think that is a, a, a factor of socialization. I believe that if uh, young, uh, if uh, boys can be raised to be responsible, then when they become men and husbands, then they will be responsible. It is also important that we raise girls to be, um, uh, to be empowered and to 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 demand to demand their, their their rights to be confident to know that uh, you know marriage is a, is a, is a, a two way thing there is no child that is born by one parent and of course uh, you know when you have single mothers with a kind of load that I've talked about before, it means even the mothers then don't have even time for, for the children. So you, you have children who are raised by TVs and nannies and not, are not by their parents. So it is not therefore an accident or strange that we are having uh, men who are not, you know, who don't feel a sense of responsibility uh, to raising their children. And then, you know, it, it, it also propels us into a cycle, a cycle whereby it perpetuates itself and the situation doesn't get better. So I believe that we have to go back to basics of raising children and of instilling values in children when they are young, so that when they grow up, they can behave responsibly. I can see that uh, Sylvain's phone is back on and he is uh, listed as a speaker in the group. Uh, so we can continue on Twitter spaces. Um, you talked about raising children, and uh, I somehow connect that to uh, people being God-fearing and uh, um, respectful of uh, the values of God, as well as the, 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 the values, well, they, they are human values in any case. But uh, I also noticed that, uh, unfortunately, we have many people who would talk about God all the time and um, expect God to solve all, all the problems. And uh, um, 
how is it that uh, we are all so god fearing but uh, a lot of people don't even simply live by the 10 commandments for example we have theft and rape and murder and we have people who are exceedingly proud or greedy adultery is all over the place uh, gluttony sloth and envy all these are cardinal sins and yet they are committed by people of all religious denominations and uh, how do you explain this what happened to us uh, uh, <clears throat> another that is a very good question it is a spiritual question of course um but uh, you know uh, when when um one has a relationship with god when you truly fear God, then you will fear to do harm uh, to other human beings, because uh, even uh, the Bible says that uh, God you don't see physically. Uh, so if you want to, 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 to respect or to fear God, you must fear doing harm to other human beings. So it is like in politics, Nada, that people talk about very good things, but do the opposite. So talk is cheap, uh, but actions, uh, you know, they will see us by our fruits. Um, so uh, it is, of course, you know, if, if you go spiritual, uh, the devil is there to make sure that uh, people do wrong. And, uh, you know, but God is also there. Uh, but um, we are the ones who are on us. God is in heaven. Of course, and he can only be on us through human beings. We are the instruments. If we allow him, he will come and do good. Uh, but also, uh, Satan uses human beings. So the the, the battle for for uh, for for the the human being is both between God and 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 Satan. So, but um, uh, historically. Uh, I believe that our even our cultures, our, our cultures had very strong values of respect, of tolerance, of, of uh, uh, mechanisms for resolution of conflicts, of integrity. You know, greed was shunned. It was shunned during my uh, childhood. Uh, you could never imagine a permanent secretary, let alone a minister, uh, uh, being a thief, you know. But today it is a norm, it is okay. So it is not only about, you know, the lip service to God, but it is also a degeneration of our cultural values uh, as human beings, you know. We did not, we valued relationship more than uh, more than uh, money you know in fact that is where uh, the, the the saying goes that uh, 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 a good name is better than uh, gold or silver you know it doesn't mean that money is not necessary it is obviously necessary but not at the expense of a good name and not money that is ill-gotten. So um, I think even traditionally, we have a serious problem. Uh, so we, we need to go back to our basics of uh, cultural values, of human values, of godly values. I can only agree with you there, because uh, uh, what little I know about Ubuntu uh, gives me the faith that uh, Ugandan people can go back to the values of Ubuntu and uh, restore uh, the values of the society and uh, take the future of Uganda from there. But uh, now, since the time is running, I want to ask you uh, two questions. 
the first is about East African Legislative Assembly. Could you brief us on what is going on there and why do you think things are not right in that house? Nada, it is, uh, it is very, very unfortunate uh, to see, for instance, the election or the nomination or whatever they call it uh, of uh, members of uh, the East African Legislative uh, Assembly has, is taking Uganda to a one party state. Uh, NRM wants to dominate wants to take it, you know, huge portion, but also starve off every other, you know. If you are a, a functioning democracy, if you, you deceive people that you are actually a functioning democracy, uh, that you have uh, 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 opposition, you have a leader of opposition in parliament and you, you know, then, it must also be res, uh, reflected in the in the in the uh, election of those who are going to represent Uganda in the East African Legislative Assembly. But what you see right now, uh, NRM has taken a lion's share, uh, but it it also has uh, uh, it has determined that they are the ones who are going to select who is going to, to, to come from the opposition, which really is very, very unfortunate, very sickening, taking back Uganda even further behind. And I don't know how they imagine other East African um, countries are looking at this. Uh, because the, the, the rules are very clear. We are supposed to have all shades of political opinion uh, so that, you know, when we are in Iyala, we are speaking about Uganda as a whole. But uh, the government has decided that. And uh, that is part of the regression, that the regression path that Uganda is on, and quite frankly, it looks like it may, it may get worse before it gets better. So, but we should tighten our belts. That is not to say that we should give up. We should actually, that should re-energize us that things are not going to change by themselves. Yeah. So, um... What I'm hearing is uh, when you say we should tighten our belts and we should re-energize, I am hearing a call to women to step up and to step into leadership and uh, political roles. Uh, is that is that correct? Is that also? when women step up, they must act differently. It's not enough to have women uh, stepping up uh, and filling the, 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 the gap of the, uh, the, the, the roles of, of men, you know? So uh, it is, I expect that if, Woman leader in this nation. We have had many of them. We have had vice presidents, now prime minister. Uh, I, I expect them to to behave much better, especially in the areas that affect women, like social services, uh, areas like accountability, uh, areas like uh, human rights human rights, I don't expect, you know, we, we, we have had uh, the issue of torture, uh, Nada, as you know, and uh, none of them, no, none of those women actually uh, uh, spoke against it and worked against it. To me, if you are a woman and you just feel a man's space, 
that is not good enough. It, yes, we are the mothers and uh, we must uh, behave differently when we get responsibility. So yes, step up women, uh, but step up to do better. Uh, finally, uh, something that concerns us all, and I don't think that uh, ordinary people are talking enough about it, or they don't maybe understand the gameplay behind it, and that is our oil. And um, yeah, I think I will deliberately say Ugandan oil. Um, Ugandan oil is being discussed in European Parliament. There was a resolution that was uh, adopted that Uganda should not go ahead and uh, Total should not go ahead to develop the oil pipeline. Uh, now, um, as a career diplomat, I'm sure you have a lot to say about uh, Europe tailoring the path for Uganda, uh, even today. And uh, I really would like to hear your take about this. Another, the issues that were raised by the European Parliament are not new issues. They are issues of human rights, they are issues of the environment, and as you know, uh, human rights are universal, and uh, um, environment affects all of us, especially knowing the challenges, the, the, the challenges we have been lately having uh, which are connected to the environment uh, in Kasese, in, uh, uh, in Bugisu, uh, we should be much more serious. So those issues, uh, I mean, the government is talking about generally just oil. Uh, they are not talking about the, uh, the, the demands for human rights and, uh, and proper compensation of uh, people. Uh, so, um, Therefore, for me, uh, every time uh, government is uh, uh, is is uh, is uh, 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 demanded to 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 behave better in the areas of human rights, then they go viral. They go viral. They they accuse their partners of being imperialists and uh, all sorts of names. But uh, when these partners are supporting us, then uh, I think the money is okay, <laughs> but the demands are not okay, uh, which is a contradiction in terms. So uh, first, therefore, it is not a new demand. It is a demand that Ugandans have put forward. Uh, so, uh, but uh, having said that, I would like to say uh, that uh, international issues, uh, 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 better resolved through diplomatic uh, engagement, not through these, uh, you know, uh, this uh, flexing of muscles, which muscles I think we do not even have. Uh, the other issue, uh, Nada, is that uh, even if that uh, resolution wasn't there, I don't think that the government was going to, to, um, to fulfill its uh, pledge or its, uh, its uh, promise to Ugandans that we are going to have oil by 2025, because so many issues are not yet addressed, you know. Uh, and, and of course, we know, we know the shifting of goalposts uh, by government, they have that track record. Now uh, they say you are going to be, you know, they give deadlines like we are going to be in the middle uh, income bracket by this date, and then we are not there. Uh, there are so many challenges, uh, even connected uh, to the production of that uh, oil uh, later on, uh, the, the, the resolution. So I think personally that uh, if I were to advise government, they should just be more serious with the uh, uh, with their uh, the, the issues and uh, work diligently and work hard and also realize that uh, really 
uh, international relations are governed better by diplomacy and not by threats. And uh, we are in, not in a position as a country. We are too weak, too weak politically, too weak economically, too weak. I mean, they should learn from countries like South Korea, the way they behave to themselves, you know, to ensure countries like Finland, countries, you know, there are many examples of how uh, wise uh, governments, so the wise leaders behave in order not to disadvantage their own, uh, themselves and their own populations, uh, but to deliberately work in order to, uh, to strengthen, you know, it's, it's if you are strong, you can always uh, threaten. Uh, you, are, you know, we are not a superpower yet, eh? so we cannot really uh, threaten the European Union and at the same time we'll be expecting them to support our budget and stuff like that. It's, it's just not proper, it is not, uh, you know, whoever is advising is not advising well. That is a very interesting take. Um, uh, towards the end, let's uh, have a few words on transition of power. Do you think it's time for Uganda to have a woman president? A woman president, let us have democracy first. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, um, uh, we should uh, transition must take place and it will, will take place because uh, there is uh, nothing uh, lasts forever. Uh, so the transition will take place. I think the biggest uh, question for Ugandans should be the type of transition and, they, and to what? to what is one conversation we have not yet really had and we, that we should have, especially given that we have had so many changes uh, since independence, I think uh, seven how many presidents, but each president has, become, has been uh, worse than the predecessor. So that should be teaching us something um, I, but also we want to have a peaceful, a bloodless uh, uh, transition. That is a very, very important thing. It is not one that you can take for granted uh, because we have seen many other transitions that have been bloody and that have not really, uh, that have been extremely uh, bad. So, uh, for me, uh, the, the issue should not be where, which gender. The issue for me should be which character, the character of the leader, because we know very well that uh, our institutions are very weak. They will not be able to, um, uh, to, to contain uh, the characters or the character that would be there. So we need a, a person of uh, high integrity, a person with a track record uh, that uh, will not be uh, promising one thing and delivering an, another thing. Uh, that is who we need. And that conversation should, should have started like yesterday, Nada. Uh, and then how do we transition uh, without, uh, uh, blood, uh, letting blood. How can we peacefully transition? Those are two things are the things that, uh, in my view, uh, should be occupying our minds. Uh, as if for the fact that there will be a transition, that one will take place. It is, uh, it is a given. Uh, change is inevitable. It will take place. But the, the, the nature of change and the, thereafter, what are we changing to? I think those are the issues that are very, very critical and very important. 
Well, just like in business, change management uh, in government uh, has to be deliberate. And uh, if, if we compare, actually, if we compare the country to a business, then the president of the country would uh, be the CEO of a business. And any CEO from uh, at, at some point in time needs to retire and has to have a kind of continuation plan. Uh, so uh, businesses invest a lot in change management to make change seamless and painless for everyone involved. Uh, what can you advise the government of Uganda to do uh, uh, in terms of change management. What can we start doing now that will give us good, positive, and um, seamless results later? Uh, first and foremost, Nada, uh, we talked about civic education. I think these issues are very, very important and uh, they must be discussed. Ugandans must understand their role in this change uh, because we don't want the president to hand pick, like he's hand picking for the East African <laughs> Legislative Assembly uh, because we want uh, there to be a transparent and credible system uh, that will enable the best to come out. So that requires uh, civic education, that requires uh, undoing some of the terrible things that have happened, like uh, militarization of our politics, uh, like monetization of our politics, so if the, the, the you know if the, the system is free and uh, free and people are able to, to uh, are educated uh, about their role and what kind of leadership, I mean you're not talking about an individual, the character of leader that uh, has been absent in the Ugandan journey since independence, uh, that should be discussed. And then uh, people will be informed, you know, because you see some people think that if uh, the current leader is uh, gone, that uh, all the, the what, all the other things will go with him, which is not true. Yeah, he, he will go definitely because all of us are, are human beings, we shall go. But the, 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 the culture, the, 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 you know, all those other powers will, will remain. So how do we deal with that? You know, we need Ugandans to understand their responsibility in this changing in the in the change that we need yeah so that you know uh, uh, during the last elections you had things like which means let whatever come come you know uh, and that is extremely dangerous it is very very dangerous because as you have rightly said nada uh, we must have deliberate change for better Change for better will not happen by accident or by chance. It will not happen. We have to work. So, so what can our people do now in order to inspire change later? We have two minutes to wrap up and I would like you to, to wrap up with this. So this is your chance to make a commercial call <laughs> to our listeners and <laughs> tell them uh, what can people do now and to make that deliberate change happen later. One, uh, uh, another um, is to understand their responsibility for the change that we need and that uh, ch uh, change will not happen by itself. Uh, well, it will happen by itself, 
but the kind of change we want will not happen by, by itself. Uh, that is one. Two, uh, they, for them to understand that they must uh, participate in politics. Uh, it is up to them to uh, choose the party that they feel they can, have, uh, they can uh, uh, join. Uh, but they must also uh, understand that if you uh, sow beans, you are going to reap beans. You are not going to harvest beans, not, not rice, <laughs> not, uh, you know, not something else. So they must understand. That is why civic education is very, very important. Uh, that is why the, 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 a conversation on leadership that is required is very, very important. And, the, and for us in Alliance for National Transformation, really, uh, uh, even if you don't support the Alliance for National Transformation, you must understand that a values-driven leadership is key to transformation. It is key to transformation. And therefore, um, that is, uh, uh, Ugandans must demand of their leaders uh, that kind of leadership. Uh, and that is why, since you allowed me to do a, a, a what, a commercial, uh, I would like to invite um, Ugandans to critically look at uh, Alliance for National Transformation, look at the track record of the leaders that are in Alliance for National Transformation and uh, come join us. There is, uh, you know, space. They, you know, they are, you know, we walk the talk, uh, or at least we do our best. And where we don't uh, make it, we actually um, uh, uh, explain why we have not been able to, to fulfill what we wanted to do. And, uh, you know, so uh, come join us, and especially women, women. We are majority, we can change things if we want to. We are the mothers of the nation. The future is, you know, is depending on us. So come and join us and let us, uh, you know, uh, transform our country uh, for the sake of uh, our children and future generation. It is doable. Uh, yes, we all have to sacrifice something but uh, we can we can uh, we can make it the other thing is uh, you know uh, that uh, probably we uh, has not been talked about a lot is that uh, politics um, or anything you want to achieve requires money uh, i think ugandans are used or they have gotten used to demanding money from politicians uh, whereas I think it is Ugandans, if they want to change, they must invest financially in that change. Uh, you know, through the leaders that are trustworthy and accountable. Thank you very much, Nada. Thank you very much, listeners. Thank yeah. you so much for tonight. And uh, although Twitter space didn't function very well for us, and it even ended abruptly while you were speaking. I would like to wrap up this uh, conversation and thank you so, so much, Ambassador Edith Grace Sempala, for giving us your point of view and uh, giving us a lot of good information that we have uh, to, to, to think about and internalize. Um, God bless you. Uh, God bless you, our listeners and viewers. And uh, till next time, this was me, Nada Anderson, with Ambassador Edith Grace Simpala. Um, have a good night, everyone. <laughs>